Hi, welcome to Diploma of Youth Work and Unit 16 and 18. The Diploma of Youth Work is at level 5, Certificate 4 is at level 4, and so Certificate 4 is quite different to the Diploma. The Diploma is a much higher level and it requires you to read and analyse material and come to your own conclusions. It requires you to be responsible for some work situations and explain processes to others and be responsible for the outcomes requires you to have a language, literacy and numeracy ability that will enable you to complete this training but also carry out your work role at this diploma level. The diploma requires you carry out some assessments with real students, not fictitious people, or at least show evidence of this. And so you'll need to do this in your residence after the training. These are small projects and they're very often the sort of things that you are already doing that are already part of your role. So you'll need to get permission from your head of boarding or your manager and your head of boarding will also assess your relevant skills and sign these off at the end of the training. At the end of this training on completion you should have a very clear understanding about the role of the youth worker should have a clear understanding about the stages of development and the different constructs of youth, the range of different contexts for young people, the knowledge and skills that will enable you to meet the diverse needs of young people, and good processes for eval evaluating your own practice, recording and reporting, and taking care of yourself. So this is not just about being competent. This is not just about completing the assessments, but this is about really knowing and being able to perform the role as a youth worker in your particular context. This, is, this video is about Unit 16, Develop and Implement Procedures to Enable Young People to Address Their Needs, and Unit 18, Work Effectively with Young People in the Youth Work Context. So these two units are clustered together because they have overlapping themes and common material. You can see here the different parts of these two units. And we've got the youth work definition, youth policy, history of youth work, types of youth work, models, youth work values, constructs. Constructs are um, how we understand young people over time, our, our mental understanding of, of a young person over time, the changing contexts for young people, uh, our application for work practice, uh, student needs, rights and responsibilities, and then just assessing and responding to the needs of young people. This uh, video series is broken into two parts because you can understand there's a lot of material in this and um, we're, it'll take too long just to have it all in one video. So there's two parts to it. There's 39 uh, questions in the assessments. They're quite detailed assessments. Um, this The assessment is 18.1a and there's two projects which are P1 and P2 which cover the practical elements of this. We want to look first of all at the definition of youth work and this is a definition that was put together by AAC, Australian Youth Affairs Coalition, I think about 2014 and it said this Youth work is a practice that places young people and their interests first. Youth work is a relational practice where the youth worker operates young, alongside the young person in their context. Youth work is an empowering practice that advocates for and facilitates a young person's independence, participation in society, connectedness and realisation of their rights. So question one asks, from, your, from reading the definition of youth work, what are four approaches that lie at the heart of youth work? And so uh, these are the parts of the slide that are in red. And I should say to you at any time, just feel free to um, take a photo of this with your phone, come back to it afterwards if you're wanting to use this for the assessments. So um, when we're looking at the approaches that are at the heart of youth work, we're going to be looking at places young people in their interests first, relational practice, empowering practice, advocates and facilitates in their context and so on. So they're the, the parts of it that lie at the heart of youth work, the approaches that lie at the heart of youth work. Um, so AAC, the Australian Youth Affairs Coalition, had a process for putting this together. They put out a consultation paper and from all the available literature on youth work, um, they put together 
um, a, a, a kind of initial definition and they asked the youth work sector the question, how can we demonstrate the value of worth, youth work and the critical importance of youth workers uh, for the development of young people, etc. So from that, they then developed a working draft definition. They distributed this back to the youth work sector for review and feedback. And then they came up with this final definition for youth work in Australia. And um, the AAC group point out that this is the sort of thing that needs to be reviewed over time. It's not going to be there for all time, but it'll be reviewed and adjusted as we move forward and have a different understanding about it. The third part of question one asks about the context. Um, what was the context for developing this definition? And we're talking particularly about the context of youth work in Australia at the time. So what we find was that youth worker roles were being included into broader occupations and professions. So that might be, say, for example, it might have been um, included into the role of a counsellor or some other person. So youth worker roles were sort of being subsumed into other broader occupations. There were occupational shortages and a lack of career pathways. There was the absence of a shared identity for youth workers. A very strong sense that, the, that youth work's undervalued. And so you might um, hear a person say, um, um, well, you know, if you've explained that you're a youth worker, the person might say to you, oh yes, but what do you really do for employment? You know, because youth work uh, was, you know, synonymous with what you do on a weekend or what you do in a spare time or what you do as a volunteer, that sort of thing. That it wasn't a real occupation or a real career. Um, so we're talking about this context around about the, you know, around about the period 2014 when the definition was developed. And youth workers believe that they receive limited support for resourcing and funding. So defining youth work, this whole process by the Australian Youth Affairs Coalition was actually quite long and difficult. And you might be thinking, well, why is that? It can't be too hard to define youth work. But it is, and these are the reasons. There's very blurred boundaries between people who would define themselves as youth workers and then all the other people who still work with young people but may not be specifically youth workers. The difficulty in defining what is distinctive about youth work the very broad scope of youth and all the different issues youth workers face, the settings in which it takes place, the levels of practice, personal values and beliefs, models, methods, approaches. So you can see it's very broad, you know. Um, there was also the problem that youth work or trying to define youth work might actually put limitations on youth work and take away from the often spontaneous nature of the work. And then a lack of data and information because there's a period from 1999 to 2010 and, and, and again now where um, peak bodies for youth work are unfunded. So there's no funding for peak bodies. Question two asks, uh, with the following priorities from the youth work definition, give an example from your own youth work context. So... We want something from your youth work context. If you're in boarding, then give an example from boarding. And so we've got a relational practice in their context, advocates for and facilitates an empowering practice, connectedness, realisation of their rights. So, you know, if you're in boarding and you're talking about a relational practice, you might write down something like um, uh, in boarding having a relationship, a professional relationship with a young person is very important to doing the role well. Um, it's very important to meeting the needs of the young people in boarding. You might write down something like that as an example from your own youth work context. All right, so let's move on and just have, unpack this a little bit more, um, the different parts of the definition. And placing young people in their interests first Young people, youth workers are clear that of all the interests out there, the interests of the young people they work with come first. Youth workers have a responsibility to a large range of other people, but you know, the students or the young people should come first. All of these bodies have an interest in the work that youth workers do, but young people are always a primary constituent or primary concern of the youth worker. Young people give youth workers consent to work with them. This consent is informal, and I suppose it's just like the um, 
the fact that a young person will communicate with you or develop a relationship with you um, and that is like consent to work for them and with them. It's a very much a relational practice. It's founded in respectful, trust-based relationships. Uh, the working relationship between a youth, youth worker and a young person is paramount to the way youth workers achieve positive outcomes. And it's really important to improve and support those relationships between young people and youth workers. In their context means that youth workers work alongside young people in their context. They recognise the impact of that context. So for you, the context might be the boarding house or the boarding environment. Um, it might also be understanding the home context or the home environment of the young person. It might be understanding um, their culture, their particular culture, um, their friends, their peers, etc. Advocates for and facilitates. Um, it's a facilitation role just rather than regarding a young person as a passive recipient. Um, youth workers aim to work with young people to affect their context, and this often means advocacy work as well. So they're wanting to improve or help their context. An empowering role, and this is a very important part of it, if a young person is empowered or has independence, uh, participates in society, then they can take control of their own experiences and make informed decisions. They can own their own identity and pursue the lives they choose. So we need to ensure that we're not doing everything for students, but that we're empowering them to do things for themselves, to become independent and self-reliant. Connectedness. So youth workers facilitate the connection of young people to others around them in society, family, community, peer groups, etc. Realisation of their role. Um, and so because of their age or their social standing, young people's rights are often not protected. And so youth workers work to protect the rights that young people have. Um, and this approach ensures that anti-discriminatory and anti-oppressive packages, practices, I mean, are maintained as it recognises young people as whole human beings with inherent rights that youth workers assist in realising so they help young people to achieve those rights. Okay, so we want to move on now to look at youth policy. What does it actually mean? You know, what is youth policy? Um, and um, how does it uh, relate to us in our country? And... Um, if you look at question three, it says, how would you define a national youth policy? And this slide here provides the answer to that. It's a, a national youth policy is a sign of a government's commitment to young people. It's a practical framework for the national youth development. Um, it's creating an encouraging environment and opportunity for a country's young people to grow and reach their full potential. So that youth policy should be achieving those things. So if we look for indicators, you know, what is what is a, um, a good or effective or functional national youth policy, we can look at the indicators established by the European Youth Forum. And one of the things that they said, and we're going to look at this later, is that we should regard young people as a resource not a problem, not a problem to be solved. So they're a resource. So let's have a look at the indicators of a national youth policy. The first is a national um, non-formal education. So, so uh, what this means is a way that young people can learn, achieve learning, but not necessarily through formal processes uh, such as vocational or tertiary education. There should be youth training. Um, there should be a youth training policy and youth, a youth uh, training process. There should be youth legislation, uh, legislation that re corresponds to the other dimensions of a proactive youth policy. There should be a budget for promoting the development of youth initiative and youth organisations. There should be youth information strategy it should ensure the transparency of government policy towards young people. It should be a multi-level policy. A national youth policy should out, 
outlined steps to be taken and policies to be implemented at all levels of government. There should be youth research. A youth policy should be based on research involving young people. There should be participation. The cornerstone of a youth policy should be the active involvement and participation of young people in society. And there should be inter-ministerial cooperation. So the Minister for Youth or Young People should be cooperating, say, with the Minister for Health, the Minister for um, Education and so on. There should be innovation. A youth policy should promote innovation. And there should be youth advising policies. So what does this question ask? Question four says, describe one area where the Australian government clearly does not meet European Youth Forum indicators for a national youth policy. So we've just had Youth Week um, in April 2018 and Australia's peak bodies got together and they put a message out to the Australian public and to the Australian government, the federal government. They call on the federal government to better address the needs of young people by reinstating a Minister for Youth and funding a national youth peak body. Um, furthermore, they, um, uh, they asked the federal government to remedy this deliberate disconnection from young people. This is fairly serious, isn't it? Um, and um, the peak bodies have called on the federal government. It's no longer a Turnbull government here in Australia, but they've called on the federal government to do these things. One is to appoint a minister for young people. Two is to commit funding for a national youth affairs peak body. And three, to reinstate National Youth Week funding to celebrate young people's achievements. So, question four asks us this. Describe one area where the Australian government clearly does not meet European Youth Forum indicators. So let's go back and have a look at them. Um, and so if we just have a look at, say, this one here, um, see indicator four, there needs to be a budget for promoting the development of youth initiatives and youth organisations. There is no budget for youth organisations in Australia. So that's one place where we do not meet these indicators. Um, so um, multi-level policy, um, so that we should have policy at all these levels. We don't even have a minister for young people or a minister for youth or youth affairs. Um, and so interministerial, see that indicator nine, interministerial cooperation. How can we do that when we don't have a minister? There is no minister for youth affairs. And um, this is not just the coalition government. It's also Labor. Labor do not have a shadow minister either. So some answers to... Question four, um, where you're asked to describe one area where the Australian government clearly does not meet European Youth Forum indicators. Okay, so we want to move on and we want to have a look at the early history of youth work in Australia. And your question here says, question five, um, identify four different approaches to youth work over the past 200 years. should just point out that in the early history of youth work in Australia, some practices were not acceptable uh, today that were practiced back then. And so we're thinking of things like caning, corporal punishment. Some practices were legally and morally wrong um, uh, throughout our history, and they're still legally and morally wrong today. And we're talking about abusing and sexually abusing young people. This is clearly an illegal and morally wrong practice. So let's have a look at the history of youth work in Australia. <clears throat> You've got to identify these four different approaches. So the first approach was a faith-based or religious approach. And so this came about in 1815 uh, when Macquarie set up some Sunday schools in Sydney. And then from that, we had this faith-based approach for the Sunday schools, which were part of churches. Then we had the YMCA, the YWCA, the Anglican Home Mission, which grew into Anglicare, which I think is Australia's biggest charity. Salvation Army, and then Tri Society. So the first was a faith-based or religious focus. The second was a social reform focus, and these were settlement houses. Settlement houses were houses that were established in low socioeconomic areas, 
and the more well-to-do people would go into them, live in these houses and bring the people from the surrounding area in to um, help them, work with them um, and um, teach them all sorts of wonderful things. So that was social reform focus. Then we had um, a values focus. So we've got faith, faith focus, faith or religious focus, social reform focus, now a values focus. And that came about with things like Boy Scouts, Girls Guys, Boys Brigade, that sort of thing. The next focus was a focus on fitness. And so these were the National Fitness Councils. And I can remember these books being around when I was a kid. This is a 1941 book, and I, w I wasn't around in 1941. But um, th uh, there was a very strong um, get fit, keep fit uh, approach to youth work in Australia in those very early years. This is um, prior to the Second World War and just after the Second World War. And then there was a focus on social justice, and we had organisations like the Eureka Youth League, where they had a very strong focus on youth justice. And then we had, um, in the 1960s, the New Left, and this was a response to the Vietnam War, largely, uh, and other things were happening at the same time. But it was a it was a political and social reform focus, so very much a political focus um, uh, in youth work in Australia around about this period. In about the 1980s, the professionalising of the um, of youth work started, and the role of youth work was more formally recognised. And so, for the first time, we saw youth work training and degrees. Um, so you could get a um, bachelor's degree or whatever in youth work and that's the first time we saw that. In 1976 the, this program here was started, Community Youth Support Scheme, quite well funded right across Australia and lots of these programs running um, but it was eventually disfunded by the government. Then we had this supported accommodation assistant program and that had a specific youth component to it. In 2002, the Australian Youth Affairs Coalition was formed for empowering young people. Um, they represented issues and uh, interests of young people and, of course, the sector that supported them. So that's us at a national and international level. They offered policy advice to governments and other organisations. They promoted the well-being of young Australians, advanced the participation of young Australians. They supported best practice in youth participation. They took a leadership role in the youth se sector, and they encouraged and supported coordination cooperation. But they were disfunded. The funding was taken off them. They went to being quite a big organisation to just one or two volunteers. So these days there's a, um, a larger number of organisations representing young people, and I hope you'll look some of these up. Um, we just want to talk very briefly about some of them. So you've got UN Youth, Halogen, um, AMF, the Youth Leadership Programs, YMCA, and so on. And so this one is um, UN Youth, um, and it's uh, this website. Um, it's got lots of information about how young people get involved with the United Nations. This is Halogen or Young Lead for Young Leaders. Um, and so we're all going to have young leaders, and you know, it would be good to get involved in that. This one here is the Australian Multicultural Foundation for Young People. This YMCA Australia. This is Generation Next. And I'd encourage all of you who are listening to this to sign up to that. You can find it on the internet and they'll send you out a newsletter quite regularly. There's lots and lots of things happening all the time. And in putting this material together and a lot of our other material, we um, uh, rely on people like this who uh, have a lot of um, very good information that's freely available to the public. They run national conferences, um, they do webinars, they have uh, weekly videos. So I'd really encourage you to sign up to Generation Next and to some of the other ones we've just had a look at. There's some more information about Generation Next. They also produce books, and um, we have those books. They're very good books, very good information and material. 
um, very relevant to you in your role in boarding. Okay, so let's move on. Let's have a look at models and types of youth work. So question six asks us to write a, descri a description. So this is like several sentences um, from your own experience of two different types of youth work. So, you know, what I'd like is um, the type of youth work, the location, facilities, program staff, that sort of thing. So these are types in Australia, accommodation services, employment assistance, training programs, education programs, counselling and recreation, community development, case management, street work, health services, drug and alcohol services, legal and court um, support, crime prevention. The main, the main types of youth work in Australia are community youth work, youth empowerment, so we mean by that, um, you know, where you're encouraging leadership, encouraging young people to have a voice. Centre-based youth work, where young people are working out of a centre, where they've got like a youth centre, might have pool tables and, you know, computers and stuff in it. Faith-based youth work, so working out of, say, youth group, church youth groups. Detached youth work, and this is sometimes called, um, it's just referred to as street work. Um, and this is, um, I, I often think of uh, the example that someone gave me of Father O'Reilly, who used to ride into Sydney um, Friday, Saturday evenings on his horse. Um, and he would just mix with the young people on the streets, talk to them, find out their needs and try and help them. That's what we call detached youth work. He didn't have a centre or anything else for doing that. Outreach youth work. So outreach youth work is where you're... Um, reaching out from a centre. So you're going out from a centre uh, to do work in the community, school-based youth work, um, where you might be doing uh, resilience programs or all kinds of programs in schools, youth development um, type work, you know, where you're doing um, developing skills and qualities and values in young people. So um, if you can have a look at those types and um, if you can write a description of just two, just two of them from your own experience. Now, if you want to use boarding as one of them, that's fine. You can use boarding as one of them. Um, we've, got a, uh, we've got six models or six um, academic models, I guess you would call it, of youth work from Cooper and White. And this came from the 1990s. This is, this is, uh, this is quite a while ago now, only 20 years ago. But um, this is still relevant. And they talk about the models of youth work being, so, so we're saying models now, not types. So it's different to what we were talking about a moment ago. Treatment, reform, advocacy, that's radical and non-radical advocacy, empowerment, radical and non-radical empowerment. Um, so um, treatment is where, you know, you would... Uh, see a young person as needing to be treated so that they uh, their, their issues could be resolved. Um, reform is where you're wanting to, um, you know, uh, reform a young person, help a young person to, um, you know, change, be different, that sort of thing. Advocacy is where you're advocating for a young person to help them achieve their their rights, and the same with empowerment. Um, uh, empowerment um, is working with young people to empower them, to help them to become self-reliant, and so on. So we have a question here, um, and this is a true or false question. And so... Um, it's just about the treatment model. The youth worker is working in a a juvenile justice program, um, the reform model, the youth worker is assisting in a personal development program, um, advocacy model, the role of the youth worker is to expose inequality, and the empowerment model, youth workers are helping in the courts. So you can probably see that um, particularly that last one is not correct, is it? So, so have a look at those. And um, 
and you just put down true or false for those. Now we want to have a look at ethics of youth work. And this is a very big and very important part of, um, of youth work. And um, so the ethics of youth work or the values of youth work. So um, when we look at these, we're looking at young people as a primary client. We're looking at ecology, non-discrimination, empowerment, non-corruption, transparency, confidentiality, cooperation, knowledge, self-awareness, boundaries, and self-care. There's a fair bit in this, but um, it's very important to what we're doing. So it's really important that you understand this, all of this. The question um, is this. It says, read the, read the relevant section. So that's 18.6. Um, uh, and show how these uh, three items primary client, empowerment, and cooperation, how they are person-centered. So, for example, if we're talking about an item here, so you can see down there in that list of items uh, under the ethics of youth work, we're talking about transparency. So this is person-centered. Transparency is person-centered because the relationship is established with the young person and the relationship will be open and truthful. So that's how it's person-centred. So um, with these three assessments, with these three um, areas, primary client empowerment and cooperation, the assessment asks that you show how these three are young person-centred. So I hope you're okay with that. Let's have a look at them. Um, and as we go through it, you might be able to unpack how they are um, youth or young person-centred. Primary client. The primary client of the youth worker is the young person with whom they engage, where conflict uh, conflicts with the obligation to one young person and another. It's always resolved in a way that avoids harm and continues to support the person least advantaged by their resolution. Ecology. So we, we most often think of ecology uh, in terms of um, plants and, you know, uh, vegetation, etc. But this is slightly different. Um, so... Well, when we talk about ecology, we're talking about the young person's whole context, them plus their friends, you know, their peers. So youth workers recognise the impact of ecological and structural forces on young people. The work of youth workers is not limited just to the young person, but also extends to the social context, their peers, etc. <clears throat> Non-discrimination. Youth workers' practice will be equitable. They won't discriminate. Empowerment. Youth worker seeks to enhance the power of the young person by making power relations open and clear, holding power holders accountable, by facilitating disengagement from the youth work relationship, and supporting the young person in the pursuit of their leg legitimate claims. So, um, so... What this is saying is that the youth worker empowers the young person. So the youth worker is not there to always do everything for the young person, but they're going to eventually help them disengage from the youth work relationship because they will be self-managing. You know, they will be self-functioning. Um, they will be empowered. Non-corruption. Youth workers and youth agencies will not advance themselves at the expense of young people. So does that mean that youth workers should not be paid? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means that they don't do it at the expense of young people. Transparency. The agreement or contract established with the young people and the relationships will be open and truthful and, and um, the interests of others will not be hidden from them. Confidentiality, information provided by the young person will be not be used against them and will not be shared with others who may use it against them. Cooperation, youth workers will recognise the limit of their role. They'll seek to co cooperate with others to get the best outcome for young people. Knowledge, youth workers have got a responsibility to keep up to date with their knowledge. Self-awareness. Youth workers are conscious of their own values, interests and approach 
um, and and, the, the, and then they approach difference with the people that they work with with respect. So if somebody's different, they respect that difference. Boundaries. The youth work relationship is a professional relationship intentionally limited to protect the young person. Youth workers will maintain the integrity of these limits, especially with respect to sexuality. The last one, of course, is um, self-care. And um, we need to look after ourselves. We can't work with young people. We can't be effective with young people. If we're totally run down, if we've got a very poor diet, if we're unhealthy, so we do need to look after ourselves and ensure our own health. So what we're asking is that you show, show how three items from that code of ethics are person-centered. That's a primary client, empowerment, and cooperation. All right, so you can probably see how important the ethics, the code of ethics, um, are for a youth worker. Um, a youth worker must have these sort of ethics as their foundation. You can probably also see that um, there might appear sometimes to be a bit of a, you know, a conflict or a tension, I guess, um, between some of these codes and your work in boarding, where you might be responsible for a whole group of people um, where you might have lots of boundaries put in place to maintain law and order. So sometimes there can be a, appear to be these little tensions, but these ethics should be the foundation of our work. There's another document here uh, written by Bernard Davies, and this is uh, called the Youth Work Manifesto. Um, it's an interesting document because it doesn't... Um, make a whole lot of statements. It, what it does is it asks a whole lot of questions. And um, and so it asks questions like this. Have young people chosen to become involved? Is their engagement voluntary? Is the practice practive, uh, proactively seeking to tip power in the favour of young people? Is the practice starting where young people are starting? And so on. And so for this question, um, what you're asked to do here is to take five of these questions and indicate if your residence is achieving this value and how. So, um, so let's have a look at the first one. Have young people chosen to become involved? Is their engagement voluntary? And so you might say something like, for most of the young people who come to boarding at our residence, they come voluntarily, they choose to come, they want to come. Uh, for some students, their parents require that they come. And so probably one of the ways in which you can deal with that is that you can make your boarding residence such a nice place to be that eventually all young people would choose to be there. So um, put in answers like that. Um, so indicate if your residents achieve these values and how it achieves these values. Let's have a look at question 10. Question 10. Um, asks um, which of the following would help you become aware of the values your students care for so um, so these these uh, here um, developing effective professional relationships with students um, uh, making time to communicate with students and hear their concerns observing students as they interact um, with other students and engage with the program. So all of those things would help you become aware of the values of your students, wouldn't they? What about this one, checking the health records? Does that help you become aware of their values? So I'll leave you to work that out. Uh, part B says this, give an example where the support you provided to a student was consistent with their values. Um, so, um, for example, um, you might, um, for example, um, look at a student who'd say been bullied online. Um, and so this student has got very strong values concerning the appropriate use of social media. So you might support them um, in those values. So 
I hope that you are able to do that. So that was question 10. All right, so now we want to look at constructs of youth. Um, and, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to wrap your head around, but a construct of a young person means how do we view them? How do we view a young person? Do you view a young person as someone who needs to be changed or someone who needs to be fixed up? Something like that. So it's interesting where this all starts because if you go back to 1962, this French historian wrote a book called Centuries of Tri Childhood and it was the first book written about children from a social perspective. Previous books had always been written from a physical perspective or a medical or a developmental perspective. This was from a social perspective. Um, and he made claims, and this is why it was so controversial, he made claims like in medieval society the, the whole idea of childhood did not exist. Um, and so, so a lot of people got, um, you know, uptight about that. They said that's just not true um, and so on. So what do we know? What, do we, what we know for sure was childhood was very different for different classes. Uh, the length of childhood increased for boys. So what we mean by that is um, the length of childhood means that the amount of time before they actually went into active work, I guess. So boys started going to school, and um, uh, but it took centuries for girls to be included in that process as well. In the 17 and 1800s, childhood became commercialised. We had toys, books, games for children. Before that, there was very little commercialisation of childhood. Um, there was education into the early teens for boys and girls to an earlier age. And this was really only for parents who could afford to pay. For Australian Indigenous parents, they had traditional child-rearing practices, which are, which are different. Um, children are self-reliant at a younger age, they participate in adult tasks, and there's a ceremony generally for boys to go into adulthood. The new arrivals to Australia uh, were convicts basically, or those who were managing convicts. So they were a rough lot. You know, whichever way you look at it, you know, th there were quite a lot of um, rough individuals amongst those people. But eventually, settlers started to come to Australia to settle here and to live, take up land. And also you had people who were convicts but now had a ticket of leave, and then they also settled Australia. So it, settled, it, it started out pretty rough, but then we eventually had you know families and other people coming to actually settle here. In the 1830s, there was a view that crime resulted from a lack of education, so the government provided money for schools, teachers and books and um, we had a standardised curriculum right across Australia. In the 1870s, school attendance became compulsory. Uh, did, it was impossible to monitor but, um, and many Australian young people did not go to school <clears throat> and of course Aboriginal young people were actively precluded from school. They were not allowed to attend. So then we start to get these constructs of um, young people or young men initially, these constructs. So uh, what construct we wanted or what view we wanted. Society wanted Australian young men who would safeguard um, the country and advance society. And so they put out a construct or they fostered a construct of manliness and increased vigour, you know, um, so that's what they, the construct that they wanted. But there was a concern that, you know, we were descending into barbarism, irreligion, vulgarity, etc. Mo mostly because we were so far removed from the civilised community in Europe, so they thought. So they suppressed masculine qualities in favour of an effeminate manliness, intellectualism, godliness and moral maturity. So that was the kind of construct that was the preferred construct in the 1870s and 19, in 1880s. In the early 1900s, there was a perceived threat to Australia. This is around the Boer War time. 
um, and they wanted tough men who could defend Australia and um, could conquer inland Australia. And so the idea of man manliness, you know, that term, um, you know, the effeminate uh, type manliness was again reworked um, more on physical strength, but also to include courage, chivalry, patriotism, military capability. So can you see how there were all these different constructs of young men through this period of time? Tough men or patriotic men or chivalrous men, etc., etc. All through that period, we had the Larrikin movement. And um, today we look at it as a Larrikin as a fun-loving, you know, individual. But they weren't in those days with general poor behaviour, fighting, drunkenness. And then, then of course, you've got the over-policing and then the anti-police sentiment and the anti-social behaviour. And this was um, associated with lower socio-economic groups. And you had Larrikin belts right through each city and you can you can still see those larrikin belts even today and you as i'm talking to you you could probably think of and identify those larrikin belts there was also the ladettes of course which were women um, who were larrikins they called them ladettes so that was another construct of young people you know um, as a um, larrikin then we had the construct of youth as being unemployed. And in the 1920s, um, late 1920s, uh, just before the Depression, um, Australians were worried that we'd have huge bands of young people roaming through the country because um, they could not get work, they could never find any work. But it never happened, of course. So this construct of youth as the unemployed, youth unemployment was about twice as high as general unemployment. So... Um, so today it's around about twice as high. It got to about 20% in the 18 in the 1980s and 1990s. And young people can be stereotyped as being um, unemployed or as being unemployable. Um, the, another construct here is that youth or young people need controlling. They're antisocial, they're out of control, they need to be managed or controlled. This was very dominant in the 1960s and 70s, but it mellowed and changed during the Whitlam years. So um, we don't see this so much these days. And there are other constructs of youth as well. Um, and uh, there's constructs where um, of, of young people being an asset to the country or the future of the country or a construct of them having worthwhile and innovative ideas that they need um, educating and moulding. So it's lots of different constructs of youth, of how people view young people. So question um, 11 uh, talks about this statement from the European Youth Forum, and it says um, it's important to look on young people as a resource, not as a problem to be um, solved. And so, um, so when we look at this construct, uh, and what we're wanting to look at here is um, why is this important? Why is it important to look at young on young people as a resource? We're youth workers, all of us who are listening to this. We're youth workers. Why is it important to look on young people as a resource? Um, and um, it's it's important because uh, a problem-oriented approach means short-term ad hoc perspectives. So we're always trying to put out fires. If we're just looking at them as, as a problem, we're just dealing with problems, we're always trying to put out fires, trying to solve problems. But if we're looking at on young people as a resource, then they're our long-term solutions. We can identify needs and develop policies to let them realise their full potential as citizens of Australia. So can you see why it's so important um, to view young people as a resource. Um, question 12 asks this. Um, it says this. List two of the practices from your work context um, that shows young people as a cons uh, having a construct of it being a resource. So can you list two practices um, you know, that show your young people being a, a resource. And I'll put down an example here. Um, 
So enabling young people to plan the NADOC week event and to be involved in directing the activities. So can you see how in that assessment um, we're using the young people as a resource? They're the planner. You know, we're using their ideas. So so they're the, res they're the resource, they're the planner. You might have lots of examples. Um, this assessment asks you to put down... Um, uh, two practices, just two practices from your boarding residence, which shows that you use young people as a resource. So that's the end of this first section. It's not the end of uh, Unit 1618, the clustered Unit 1618. There is a second part to this video, and you'll need to look at the second part of this video to go on and do the rest of the questions. Thank you very much.